Hi, everybody. Welcome to Build a Natural Medicine Cabinet. I'm Lily Cunning, Community Herbalist, and I'm also Chief Formulator for Haven Herbs. Um, you're here because you want to know some alternatives to some traditional uh, things that most people have in American medicine cabinets, um, in, from remedies to body care. And so let's get started. So natural remedies are not only just as or more effective, but many um, get to the root cause of a problem. Um, you know, uh, in modern sort of biochemical medicine uh, that folks use on the everyday, things that you get insurance for, for example, uh, it's just about symptom management. And don't get me wrong, when you're in pain, you want the pain to stop, right? Um, but symptom management does not relieve the issue and it just sort of makes you reliant on more symptom management style drugs. So um, with herbal medicine, especially if you go see a practitioner like myself to get a clinical visit, you're not only going to uh, have remedies that deal with uh, symptoms that are unpleasant, but we're also as clinicians going to look to find why you are experiencing the pain and try and eliminate that root cause so that you aren't reliant on drugs. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, so <clears throat> let's start with the most common thing that tends to be in American medicine cabinets, NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, things like Aleve and Advil and Tylenol and Aspirin and all the generics that um, those include, which are on the bottom of the slide. <clears throat> so these things are all about symptom management, right? They are for pain and inflammation. Um, and they, uh, you know, they're effective. That's why people use them, right? They're going to get rid of that unpleasantness for whatever reason. Um, but people become reliant on them. I've known many people um, who have a chronic condition. And so one of the ways that they met, you know, um, moderate their pain is by using NSAIDs almost every day. And honestly, there are some serious side effects with long-term use. Um, you know, having an occasional um, ibuprofen isn't going to do some damage. But if you're taking them ongoing daily or like a lot of them all at once, you could do some damage to your liver and stomach. Your digestive tract was never meant for that level um, of uh, ongoing daily chemicals. And in the short term, you know, it can cause some digestive issues like gas and bloating and nausea and constipation and all different kinds of things like that. So if you're experiencing that and you have been taking NSAIDs, um, you know, on a regular basis, you might try pausing and seeing if those digestive symptoms uh, go away after a couple days. You also have an increased chance for heart attack or stroke when you take these on the regular, and it can also cause vertigo-like symptoms. So what do you do for pain, inflammation, fever, or cramping? So um, in my medicine cabinet, um, you know, I'm an herbalist, so I have a lot of natural remedies uh, for my headaches, and I do get some pretty intense ones. Um, I get migraines occasionally, and I get uh, weather-related headaches with my sinus passages swelling. Um, I use uh, essential oil roll-ons. I put it on my temples and under my nose, um, and that actually helps uh, mitigate some of the inflammation that's on these nerves here that cause the pain. Uh, it also, um, you know, shrinks sinus passages. I also take tinctures. Tinctures are alcohol-based extracts of plants for uh, pain and inflammation. Um, at Haven, we have one called the Gripes, which is an NSAID replacement. And it's across the board, kind of the way you would take ibuprofen, you would take the Gripes, um, because it relieves all of those things, fever and cramping included. Um, I uh, have some chronic pain management that I need to deal with. Um, I was injured on the job, um, and so I have musculoskeletal um issues. And so I drink golden milk every day. And the way that I do it, <clears throat> first, let me tell you what golden milk is. It's um, a milk-based uh, drink. 
that includes turmeric uh, and it should also include some black pepper because those two synergistically work together to make the turmeric uh, constituents more absorbable in the body. The golden milk that I make is actually Haven's turmeric tea paste. It's turmeric, ginger, black pepper suspended in raw local honey. So it's like a paste. And I mix that into my milk of choice, which happens to be oat. I'm not a big dairy milk fan. Um, and so you can do it in any kind of milk or alternative milk. It's fat soluble. So you're going to get even more benefit from it, taking turmeric in that way. And I put it in my coffee every morning so that it's just part of my regular routine. And if you are ingesting turmeric um, on the regular, it keeps you way more flexible, reduces chronic inflammation in the body. I uh, have uh, mild osteoarthritis in my hands and I like to embroider and do lots of crafty things. So this helps keep me flexible. Um, salves for different kinds of sore muscles, especially for overexertion. There's lots of things out there that will help you alleviate temporary pain and inflammation or a soak like a bath uh, with Epsom salt and some herbs that are anti-inflammatory. There are lots of herbal teas out there if you like drinking tea. Um, for myriad specialties, the one that's on the screen is for menses issues like cramping and mood swings and PMS, um, moon time tea. But we also have like a headache tea and all kinds of stuff. Um, and letting fever happen. So I, I wanted to put this out there because we have trained ourselves as Americans to reduce fever as soon as it manifests. And that actually is counterproductive. Fever is an immune response. Um, your body is reacting to what it thinks is a pathogen. Um, and it's trying to raise your temperature so that it kills the pathogen, but not you. Um, and so letting fever take its natural course, as long as it's not excessive or too long, is important. Um, if you are constantly, when you get sick, taking something to reduce your fever, you're actually prolonging your illness. Um, as long as it's not above 102 and it doesn't go on for three days or more, um, let your fever happen. I know it's uncomfortable, but your body is doing its job. Um, and I just wanted to put out there that um, until about 1986, most pharmaceuticals were extracted from botanicals and then compounded. Uh, it wasn't until after that that synthetics were more common in pharmaceuticals. And that wasn't because they were more effective. It was because they were more uh, cost effective, right? There was a higher profit margin involved for pharmaceutical companies if they could just replicate these things. So um, one of the things as an herbalist that I know to be true is when you take a whole plant rather than an extracted phytochemical and then compounding it is it has less side effects in the body. Um, you know, every single pill that you take, if you look at the label that comes with it, there will be a list of side effects. Well, those are buffered by the other phytochemicals in the plant when you're taking whole plant medicine. Um, that isn't to say that plants aren't potent. That isn't to say that some plants wouldn't be um, not for you uh, as an individual and some plants aren't dangerous, right? Arsenic comes from plants. Um, however, generally speaking, when you are working with an herbalist, they're going to give you whole plant medicine because you're going to see less adverse side effects. Uh, let's talk about another thing that most people have in their medicine cabinet, and that's an antibiotic ointment. So, um, you know, usually they're like triple antibiotics. There's three different strains of antibiotics in suspended in a lotion, a cream, or an ointment. Um, and as a culture, we have overused antibiotics. We infuse them into plastics. We have them in soap, and soap already kills bacteria. So why are we doing that? Um, and what we have done is created some superbugs um, that are very resistant to treatment with antibiotics because we overuse them and they've uh, cleverly uh, evolved to not be affected. Um, I also don't like the use of petroleum and other toxic preservatives in these particular remedies. Um, I would much rather uh, use a natural version of antibiotic that doesn't have all of those synthetics that can get into your bloodstream. Um, and frankly, you know, with the antibiotic resistance, that means that these types of remedies are losing their effectiveness. Um, and so what do we do? We use salves like boo-boo balm. 
And one of the things that uh, I found really amusing was a couple of years back, there was a study that they found an ancient recipe from the Middle Ages for um, an antibiotic um, treatment, like a topical antibiotic. And, you know, it was very particular in what were the ingredients and you had to produce it in a, a brass vessel and everything chemically together made uh, an antibiotic that was more effective on MRSA than modern treatments, right? Because MRSA is a huge problem now, especially in hospitals, um, because they're resistant to our antibiotics. Um, so, uh, you know, there are lots of treatments like Boo Boo Bomb uh, out there that use herbs that are antibiotic, antiviral, antifungal, um, and there's no petrochemicals in them at all, right? So you're not contributing to microplastics in your body and in the environment. Um, most salves are put into metal tins. They're not housed in plastic. And I'm gonna talk about how uh, packaging is important with your body care. Um, and they're preserved with beeswax, which is medicinal in its own right. Um, so I tend to veer towards salves uh, rather than ointments and uh, creams. So, uh, Americans have digestive issues, particularly acid reflux, uh, going into GERD, uh, gas and bloating. And statistically speaking, about 25% of office visits uh, tend to be for digestive reasons. And these over-the-counter, and you can also get them uh, by prescription, proton pump inhibitors or PPIs are being used and pop like candy. Um, I've had many, many clients who didn't realize they shouldn't be taking them long term and they should never be taken long term. But because of the way they're designed, where you're supposed to take one a day, regardless of if you have symptoms to prevent heartburn, people are taking them for long term periods and um, they've not been studied for long term use. Um, and so we're talking liver damage, increased risk of fractures and pneumonia, all kinds of stuff. It's there are a huge list of side effects, especially if you use them long term. And so I don't ever recommend these. I know that acid reflux can turn into GERD, which can turn into cancer. Um, but there are other better ways of dealing with the root cause so that you don't have the acid reflux. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for acid reflux. Um, and so getting to the cause um, is the best way rather than just symptom management, which is what these do. Um, what I tend to recommend for my clients that come to me with GERD or acid reflux is digestive bitters. Um, Americans don't really eat a lot of bitter foods or drink a lot of bitter beverages like other cultures do. And if you're asking yourself, well, what's a bitter food? You just proved my point. Um, as a culture, we like sweet, we like processed, we avoid bitter, we think of bitter as like a bad thing. But in other cultures, bitter is a regular flavor that is consumed. And we as human beings evolved to eat that flavor because we have bitter receptors, not just on our tongue, but throughout the entire digestive tract and even in our brain and our lungs. And when they are stimulated, they stimulate proper functioning. Let me say that again. When you stimulate your bitter receptors, you stimulate proper functioning. So that means salivary glands working, digestive enzymes being produced, insulin being produced, uh, bile being produced and released strategically, uh, nutrient absorption, all of those functions of the digestive system optimized. So we're not gonna have uh, overproduction of acid or acid being produced at an, uh, an inappropriate time, which leads to reflux, you're gonna see a tonifying, a strengthening of that system the more you take it. And this is the one product that I make that I recommend for everyone because Americans don't eat bitter food, right? So it is a food replacement. Um, it is a tonic, which means it's actually good for you. And the longer you take it, the more clinical efficacy it has, the better your digestive system operates. Um, and my formula is a two-part formula. There's the digestive part and the bitter part. So the bitter tonic is what I just talked about. It stimulates those receptors. The digestive part uh, is full of what herbalists call carminatives. And they... Um, 
they help with gas and bloating and nausea and all of those temporary discomforts of the digestive system. So you can take this product as a tonic 15 minutes before a meal, or if you overindulge or you eat something that doesn't agree with you, you can take it as a remedy. Um, it's just really great to keep in your dining room. And that's where I keep mine. I don't keep mine in my medicine cabinet, actually. I keep it out there so that I remember to take it before a meal. Um, it's just going to make everything work better. And uh, the vast majority of my clients who start taking bitters on the regular see their digestive symptoms um, go away. And because your digestive tract is enervated, so it has uh, links to the nervous system, most of your immune system is in the gut, and a lot of your endocrine system is based in the gut, you're going to see whole body benefits when you strengthen your digestive tract. So eating healthy food, taking bitters, and slowing down when you eat can actually do a whole lot for your digestion. As a culture, we've let uh, capitalism and our bosses determine when we can eat for how long, and usually it's too fast. We're not helping our digestion. We end up going through the drive through or eating like a bag of chips uh, instead of a healthy meal, right? Um, whenever you can, prep food so that you can eat whole food um, and slow down right? If you have a 30 minute lunch uh, for your job, make sure your lunch is already prepared and go ahead and eat your lunch as slow as you can. Um, you know, tack on that extra 15 minute break that you get uh, onto your lunch and take 45, you know, do what you can to help your digestive tract actually do its job effectively. Let's talk about allergy medicines and antihistamines. These are pretty common in medicine cabinets too. Um, an antihistamine is one that shuts down an immune response called the histamine response. Sometimes they also have decongestants added. It's those allergy formulas that have a hyphen D on the end that also have decongestants. Often people take antihistamines if they have an itch response, which is also uh, a histamine immune response. Um, and people, you know, they want to shut down those adverse symptoms. And I know because I get um, allergies, uh, hay fever type allergies. And when I get them, my eyes are itchy and watery and I can't like see very well. And I've got congestion, which causes a congestion headache and I'm sneezing a lot and it interferes with your life. Right. Um, and so rather than taking, um, you know, Zyrtec or Claritin or any number of uh, allergy medicines, um, I actually take an herbal tincture. Um, <clears throat> I formulated it when I first moved to Ohio. I moved to Ohio from California where I didn't have seasonal allergies at all. And then when I moved back to the Midwest, because I grew up here, um, all of a sudden I had seasonal allergies. And so antihistamine herbs are common. Um, mine uses stinging nettles and eyebright, but there are others. Um, ingesting those on the regular um, help uh, work out uh, histamine response. You can also take uh, immunomodulators. Herbalism is blessed in that we not only have immune stimulators and immune suppressants, but we also have immune modulators. And they help your immune system find a golden mean of how to respond to things. And an immune um, response that's uh, allergies is your body freaking out over something that maybe isn't a pathogen. It's maybe pollen or dust, um, but your body is reacting to it like, oh, it's a pathogen. We need to expel it. And so it creates lots of mucus to trap the pathogen. It starts flushing things out. Um, things swell because it's bringing immune cells to an area. So your sinus passages swell. Um, but, you know, it's reacting to something that's not really a pathogen. So shutting down that response is appropriate. So, yeah, antihistamines, um, immune modulators like reishi mushroom, um, decongestants. So, you, you know, you need to get all that mucus out. So uh, mullein is a great one. All of those hot, spicy things like ginger and cayenne and horseradish, those, if you've taken them, you know, like, woo, it all comes out. Um, and then itch relief, in case you're having topical stuff, I tend to use plantain, uh, not the banana, but the, the little weed that grows in the cracks of the sidewalk, um, and myrrh, which is a resin. I tend to use those as um, 
some pretty common itch relief in salves and things like that. So now let's switch gears a little bit. We've been talking about remedies, but also your, your daily body care, which tends to be in medicine cabinets, um, you should pay attention to that too, because what you put on your body is as important as what you put in your body. So um, toothpaste and shampoos tend to have sodium lauryl sulfate, SLS or SLES in them, and it is a surfactant, so it creates that lather action. And Americans have been trained to associate that lathering with cleanliness somehow, and it's not true. Um, it's just an effect, it's a marketing effect, and frankly, SLS causes canker sores and dandruff and separation of uh, skin tissue and gum tissue. Um, it's an irritant and a corrosive, and they use it in factories to degrease engines. It's just not something that should be in our body care, but it's a cheap way of them having that um, effect. But if you're having chronic canker sores, you should switch to a toothpaste that doesn't have SLS um, or switch to a tooth powder. Tooth powder doesn't have all those preservatives to keep it all uh, uniform like a paste. Um, it doesn't um, perish as easy, right? Um, powders, as long as they stay dry, are good for a long time. And tablets. I uh, recently tried tooth tablets and it's like a little, it looks like a little piece of aspirin and you chew it and then um, you can brush your teeth with that. And that's zero waste too. Um, we're not getting rid of those plastic tubes. Um, get things that are packaged in glass and metal. And here I'm going to talk about the microplastics problem. Microplastics are in all of our bodies now and they're in the environment and they're not good and they cause endocrine disruption. Uh, which your endocrine system regulates your whole body. So it causes autoimmune disease and cancer and all kinds of crap. Uh, excuse me for saying crap. Um, but you really want body care that is packaged in glass or metal or paperboard. Plastics contribute to the toxification of your product. Um, and if you can avoid plastics, you should. Um, <clears throat> so deodorant, the kind of deodorant that you can use that doesn't get packaged in plastic are pit pastes, where you take a little bit on your finger and you rub it into the armpit, or sprays uh, that are packaged in glass. Um, they're less toxic to you. They have no parabens um, or fragrance. So, uh, well, they might have essential oils for fragrance, but fragrance as an ingredient list, uh, in your ingredient list on your body care, you wanna avoid anything that says fragrance because the United States has determined that fragrance is a proprietary formula. And so they know people are looking for ingredients like parabens. And so they move the parabens into fragrance, which is proprietary and not disclosed um, in order to keep the parabens in the formula. Um, parabens are in there to reduce mold and um, spoilage, but they're also carcinogenic. Um, and when they do breast cancer biopsies, uh, the tumor, 90-ish percent of them have parabens present. So avoid parabens and avoid fragrance and get things that are not packaged in plastic. That plastic, all those petrochemicals are leaching into your product and then you're applying it to your body and your skin is not a total barrier, right? You absorb chemicals into your skin, into your fat cells, into your bloodstream. Mouthwash. Um, avoid things like Listerine. They're actually banned in other countries because they contribute to cancer. Um, you can easily make a gum and mouth rinse that kills bacteria. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and strengthens the gums. Uh, Haven makes one that's pretty simple and is approved by dentists. Uh, lotion is another uh, body care product. Do not buy lotion in a plastic bottle. Do not buy lotion from the store in these huge bottles because they have shelf stabilizers, homogenizers, preservatives. When you think about what lotion is, it is a liquid that's been emulsified with fats and they stick together. And if you think about your salad dressing, like if you make a vinaigrette and you shake it, it stays together for a few seconds, right? And you pour it on your salad, but it wants to separate. That is a natural occurrence, right? Oil and water do not mix. How do you get them to mix? You use an emulsifier. <clears throat> now emulsifiers aren't necessarily bad, right? Vigorous shaking can be an emulsifier. Um, 
but most people use like a wax or some chemicals to bring those molecules together and keep them together. Separation is natural. And in order to get something to stay fused together, think about what kind of chemicals you need to use. Um, it's much better to either make your own lotion or buy lotion that is created in small artisanal batches without parabens um, and mold inhibitors, right? Small batch stuff. Um, facial cleansers and treatments, you can exfoliate and get rid of dried skin with all kinds of gentle exfoliants like grounded zuki beans or um, almond meal is another one that we use. Using clay and powdered botanicals for face mask treatments, just as high quality as a spa treatment. Uh, different kinds of seed oils like rosehip seed, sea buckthorn, carrot seed. Those oils are fantastic as wrinkle serums because what they do is they help um, the skin cells to regenerate faster. It's, it's something that uh, is a property of seed oils. So they make really great serums. And acne treatments. Using spot treatments coupled with internal liver cleansing herbs is really great at helping with um, acne vulgaris. All right, so now we've gotten to the point where maybe you're interested in making your own or doing research on the products that you already have in your home. So I've put here uh, some resources for DIY. So if you're looking for botanicals to make your own, um, I highly recommend Mountain Rose Herbs, Star West Botanicals, uh, and locally in Columbus, Clintonville Natural Foods has a bulk section as well. For butters and oils and essential oils, Mountain Rose Herbs, um, plant therapy, Earth Elements is a local brick and mortar store in Columbus and they have essential oils and shea butters and cocoa butters and things like that. And Bulk Apothecary is in Ohio and actually carries quite a, an assortment uh, of organic and non-organic oils and butters and essential oils. And if you're looking to do some research on the products that are already in your home, I highly recommend Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. They have databases of ingredients as well as brand name products and you can search for them. The cosmetics one is called Skin Deep and they also have one for house cleaners. You can look those things up. And then safecosmetics.org also has a similar function where you can look up products um, and see what kind of grade they get for uh, wellness and, and health and also environmental toxicity. And if you're looking for recipes to get started, the Mountain Rose Herbs blog has some really great recipes. You can go to their website, go to their blog and search recipe. And there's just a ton of resources there. They've been in business since the 70s. You can imagine how many are there. And Herb Rally is a really great website that has a podcast um, as well as a blog with recipes they're just really great. And if you're looking to get some more information or you're looking for ready-made products, um, Haven Herbs sells products. They also have a blog um, where we profile herbs and different products. And there's my website as well if you're looking for clinical consultation. Thanks for your attention today and I look forward to speaking with you.